If you've ever bought a rifle because of Call of Duty Modern Warfare, and I mean the original one, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Guys, today we're going to be talking about the beautiful evolution of HK Roller Delayed weapons. We have the baby HK Roller Delayed, which will then grow up to be <laughs> the adult HK Roller Delayed. So we're talking about the PTR-91 today. The PTR-91, of course, being a clone of the HKG3, a very, very famous weapon. And in many ways, they are very similar, and in many ways, they are very different. We have to give a big shout out to James Williamson for helping us with some of the information on this. He is, of course, the HK guru around these parts. But hope you guys will join us today as we talk about the PTR-91. Now, before we do that, we, of course, have to thank the biggest sponsor of the channel, the Sonoran Desert Institute. A big thank you to them. If you're looking to get your start into gunsmithing, they absolutely rock and we love them a big thank you to them they sponsor all of our science stuff as well so again sonoran desert institute thank you to them and of course we have to thank the sponsor of this video primary arms a big thank you to primary arms for sponsoring this video uh, we've always been big supporters of primary arms on a personal note i like their optics and of course the best part about them are they the most high-end optic out there no, of course not what they are is a really good optic for a really good price. They're also uh, doing some good things, so definitely keep your eye on Primary Arms. A big thank you to them again. Without further ado, let's get into it. I really love um, all these European battle rifles because it's basically the saga of how we fucked Europe. So you have to understand that um, as we were looking to replace uh, the M1 Grand travesty, of course, um, and we adopted the M14, we basically strong-armed every European country into adopting the 7.62 by 51 NATO. Most countries didn't want to do this. They wanted to have a smaller intermediate caliber that made a lot more sense. Hint, hint, for us, of course, we switched to the 5.56 not too long after. But for us, after we went from the M14 to the M16 and went down to the 5.56, a much smaller, more manageable caliber, because we realized that 7.62 by 51 NATO to every single guy was a lot of firepower. Uh, we had a lot of economy. Guess who didn't have a lot of economy? All these small European countries who were then stuck with these 308 battle rifles. And uh, you know what? They made do with them. And in many ways, uh, we had a lot of Viking, you know, war parties going out with 308 battle rifles, which is pretty cool. And that definitely brings us to the tale of the HKG3. So the thing that is really interesting about the HKG3 or the PTR-91 on which it is based now, the really interesting thing about the HK G3 and also the PTR-91, because it is based on the G3, is that it doesn't specifically have a gas system. It is a roller-delayed weapon. So when that weapon fires, that force of that round expel you know, expelling and the recoil coming back on the bolt carrier group is going to unlock based on these rollers. It's a very interesting mechanism. I'm not forgotten weapons. We're not going to really get into it today because we're more about the shootability of the weapon. But it is a really cool system, and it is a very robust system. We'll talk more about that in a second. Another thing that you have to note is that these weapons, of course, feed from detachable box magazines. They feed from 20, 30 rounders, and whatever else anybody can come up with. I know there are drum magazines, which are mega base out there. Now, there are some very significant differences from the G3 to the PTR-91. I do want to talk about that. But before we do, a quick note about the G3 is that when we mention that, we have to mention how incredibly robust that rifle is. Um, a lot of people talk about, um, is the FNFAL the best rifle or is the HKG3? And for most of these people, they've only ever fired shittily made clones by DSA and Sentry Arms, so they don't really have a dog in the fight. But when it comes between those two, they're each good in their own right. But one thing that can be said about the HKG3 is that while the recoil is quite stout on this compared to the FNFAL, which is much easier to kind of dial the gas system in for the particular round that you're using. The G3 is known to just run for a very long time. So it is an overgas system. It does hit you hard, but it will always kick that brass out. It will always power through that mud. There are plenty of pictures of G3s and FALs as well that are still serviceable in Africa, despite God knows 50 odd years of just hard use in those uh, in those environments. So it is a legendary system. But the question is, when we bring it to an American manufacturer like PTR, how do they do? How is this rifle compared to the legendary G3? So we're going to do it my Marines love. Tip to butt. We're going to limp into the Navy today just to make you guys a little angry. Love my Marines out there. So to start off with, 
when we're talking about this rifle, going to the very tip of the rifle with the flash hider, it's a very traditional flash hider, especially on the PTR-91. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, except for the fact that, of course, we have the port uh, complete 360. Typically, you do want a little bit of um, shieldage down there, and the reason for that is you're fi if you're firing in the prone, which you are apt to do with a battle rifle, um, you're going to kick up a lot of dust. This can, of course, be problematic for you with the dust getting back in your eyes or, you know, clogging up the weapon or two, um, that dust kicking up is going to then uh, give away your position. So I'm not a huge fan of the muzzle device that PTR is uh, included on this. It, of course, is very easy to change. Now, going back from there, we do have the barrel. Now, when it comes to PTRs, there are a couple different models and different calibers as well. But for the 308 variant, we are looking at a 18 inch model and we are looking at a 16 inch model. This is of course the 18, we want the long boys. The This isn't as long as your typical FALs, but it is completely on par with what you see from the Parafowl, which was heavily used. Now, a very interesting note when it comes to these barrels, and again, we have to thank James Williamson again, the H key guru for kind of walking me through this stuff is that uh, compared to a lot of um, battle rifles out there, because there is no gas system, the barrel is pretty much free floating in the sense that you might look at it and be like, ah, this is the gas system. It is not actually, once you take the dust cover off there, you'll find that the front sight post is simply attached to the barrel. And there's a lot of movement allowed there so that this weapon can flex as those rounds are traveling down those barrels. That flex allows the weapon to be ultimately more accurate. So I've seen a lot of contention online about how accurate is the HKG3, how accurate is the PTR-91. It, it, it is of course hard to say whether I got a good one or a bad one. And again, I only have a kind of sample size of three here that I'm able to test with. But with the PTR-91s that I have grouped, uh, in every case with uh, Norma gold medal match, and big thank you to Norma for sponsoring ammunition, they were able to capture about between 1.1 and 1.2 MOA, uh, which is psychotic. I actually thought it wasn't real. We grouped it multiple times. These were all five round groups. And consistently the PTR-91 would group about 1.1 to 1.2. And with typical M80 ball, as we got from Norma, and again, good ammunition company, uh, we were getting around 1.7, 1.8 MOA. And of course, these are all at 100 yards. So for me, that is pretty, phenomenal accuracy from a service battle rifle. And I've been very impressed with the accuracy that I've gotten from, from these weapons. Now, I'm not as happy with the barrel. And the reason for that is one thing that made the HKG3 such a phenomenal weapon was that it had a cold hammer forged barrels. If you don't know about these, these barrels are superior in terms of their barrel life and their ability to withstand full automatic fire and heat. And especially with the Teutonic engineering of HK, it's uh, some mixture of German elements we don't talk about. The G3s were able just to last forever and many HK barrels last forever. And with these, I'm not particularly sure, so I'm not going to specifically name the manufacturer of what I believe the barrel to be. But it is, of course, domestically produced. And it is not a cold hammer forged barrel. Um, I do, you know, that's irksome for me. I would like that in, in a weapon that I would want to be a battle rifle in every way. Because for me, a weapon should be ready for combat, should be ready for that hard use. That's kind of the, the reason I get these types of weapons. So to have a barrel that isn't, you know, at that level of what I would want from it in terms of the barrel life, just a little bit of a disappointment to me. At the same time, I do have to note and say how good the accuracy is on this weapon. So I can't fault it for that. Am I nitpicking? Probably. So we'll go ahead and we'll skip to the next part. Front sight post is of course wonderful. It is hooded. It's your typical HK style and it is wonderful. Now on the left hand side right here, next to the front sight post, we do have a provision to mount a sling, whether that is a hook or whether you thread paracord through that, you do have what you need to mount a sling. Going back from there, we do have the handguard. Now we have a classic slimline handguard on this guy because I like the way they look and I kind of like the gray finish that we have here. Makes for a very attractive rifle. But I have to say that the wide handguard 
is a better choice if you have to buy one or the other. And then of course, if you're able to upgrade to a spur, that is a much better handguard that allows you to mount whatever you need and allows the barrel to cool much better. So I would certainly recommend an upgrade if you were actually thinking about using this in a professional manner. From here, we do have the charging handle so that of course folds in, we can pull that back and we can lock the weapon back. Now what's interesting, this, this always of course brings up the HK slap, I'll do it for you guys. Um, the question is, when you load the weapon, how, what is the proper loading procedure? Now, funny enough, uh, many people have talked about this, including Firepower United, a big shout out to him, but these weapons can be seated and loaded without locking the bolt to the rear. So if you have a full mag, you can simply eject one mag, put in your full mag, and you can simply charge the weapon and you'll be absolutely fine. But that being said, for ease of loading or uh, because you're so used to the HK MP5, many people do tend on the HK G3 and their clone variants to lock the bolt back, to eject the mag, new one in, and then slap the charging handle. There's no right way. Uh, I will say, however, that um, slapping the G3 is probably a good thing. Um, because it deserves it for one, and then two, because you don't want to allow the charging handle to kind of be babied forward. If it doesn't have enough momentum, that bolt carrier group might not go fully into battery and completely seat that round, in which case it won't fire. Then you'll have to perform remedial action and get the weapon back up into the fight. So for many, many people, locking the roller delayed weapons back and giving it a good slap ensures that it has the momentum to carry that bolt forward to ensure that that round is fed in. And plus it just feels good to hit your G3. Moving back from there, we do have a Picatinny mount for optics on this particular weapon. Now I should note that some people have pointed out, and this is gonna be kind of a recurring theme as we talk about the PTR-91, that their optic rail wasn't quite centered. So you kind of find with PTR that these are completely American-made rifles and there might be some problems. They're certainly far from perfect. It's a little bit of a gamble. They do seem to take care of you once you turn those weapons into warranty and you'll get a good rifle back. But as far as getting a working weapon straight out of the package, um, kind of playing a little bit of a uh, roulette with, the, uh, with your money there. But in the case of mine, mine was absolutely fine. My Optic rail is perfect, and in fact, we zeroed this with multiple different optics from this Trijicon Reflex right here to a Elkan Spectre to a Night Force NX8 4-32. All were fine. Didn't have any problems with bottoming out the zero or having anything weird going on. In fact, for the Trijicon Reflex when I mounted it, it was previously on an M4. It was almost dead on. Pretty cool. I don't know how that happens. It's weird. some weird type of magic. I don't like to think about it. I'm pretty sure... It's a bad curse or something. Now, when it comes to the bolt carrier group, the operating mechanism, this isn't built to the same standards as the HKG3. Um, those Teutonic gods are on a different level. Now, PTR-91 is, of course, made by PTR. It is American-made, and the tolerances don't seem to be go as good. So you will sometimes get weapons that are good, sometimes not. Now, in any case, PTR does recommend a good break-in period on the PTR-91, anything from... Uh, 300, maybe a little bit north of that. Now, some people, their weapons need no break-in. For some, it never breaks in and they have to send it back for warranty repair. In any case, I would certainly recommend putting around 1,000 rounds through your PTR-91 before you're to kind of sit down and be like, I will bet my life on this weapon. It is good to go, just to ensure that it's running well. In the case of mine, I did have um, quite a few uh, stoppages and light primer strikes and other weird issues up through around the 200 round mark. After that point, it kind of leveled off and it felt a lot better. Um, mine's been pretty good since. Uh, I have a couple thousand rounds on it at this point. It's fairly well worn in and it feels good and smooth. Um, still a little bit hesitant, kind of due to the reputation and perhaps um, you know the occasional stoppage that I'll get. I'm using good military brass ammunition, but gives me a slight pause, I guess. In the same breath, I do have to note that many people who have the PTR-91 have noted them to be extremely reliable. Um, I'm only going off of what I've seen from the rifles that I have time on. Understand that. Am I being a little bit harsh? Perhaps. Moving down to the lower right here. So we do have two magazine releases, and like any HK firearm. So we have magazine release there, which is impossible to hit unless you have giant Swedish Nordic giant hands, in which case, good for you. You're a monster. Uh, we also have the paddle release, which is what us lay people use and 
it works absolutely fine as I struggle to get that in. Now, the best part about the PTR91, about the HKG3 clones, are the mags. The mags are super cheap, super well made. Uh, you have aluminum, you have steel ones, and they are absolutely awesome. It is the best part. You can buy these for like five bucks. I uh, used to be able to buy them for way less, and they work extremely well. Best part of the HK. Um, G3 clones by far. Now, moving back from there, we of course have our grip, we have the lower right here, and the fire control mechanism. So, there has been much talk about the fire control mechanism when it comes to the HK G3. And when it comes to this particular one, I did have it modified by Mark III Firearms out of Las Vegas. A big thank you to them. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and check out their trigger work that it they have done in this rifle that, have, that has made it quite a bit better. So, for the first time in Grand Thumb, we're going to be ghosting that PTR 91 trigger. Check that one more time. Don't want to put a 308 through my roof. Go kill an Elon Musk satellite by accident. All right. So, no play into it. I'm straight at my wall already. About a millimeter of creep. Two, three, let off. About five-ish pounds right there. Feels like, an, like a good AR trigger. Not a good, but feels like an okay AR trigger. Okay, from the reset, about a millimeter in play, and that's about a two and a half pound let off. Total, I'll give it about five, and then from that reset, around two, once you've traveled through that break, that's a wonderful trigger for, a, for HKG3. And from the footage that we're gonna show right here, it's a fast one. Uh, with this trigger on, this is a ridiculously fast gun. And a thing that you'll also note about this gun is recoil. HKG3s recoil a little harder um, than their counterparts like the M14 or the FAL. There's a lot that we can say about this, right? We can say it's terrible, it's a terrible design, but there's a reason for it. The Teutonic gods know what they're doing. And the reason for that is that the G3, the PTR91 is absolutely shucking brass into the next county. When you fire this weapon, it will launch 308 at about a two o'clock pattern and it will go a solid 15 20 feet uh, you could probably kill somebody with this brass you can't but it's spinning so fast and you can see in the videos you can just see that brass just sailing off it really goes and it if you don't have any type of deflector on there your brass is going to be a little bit damaged and it might be a little bit harder to reload understand that there are some old boomers out there who have figured it out but understand that compared to your typical weapon, you're gonna see a little bit more damage to your brass uh, compared to any other battle rifle when it comes to the G3 series. We of course have to talk about the wonderful rear sight. It is a typical drum sight, just like your any other HK type firearm with a V notch at one sight, along with your peep sights all the way out to 400. Um, I love the HK sights so much. And on the PTR-91, they were very easy to zero and they were absolutely dead on. But of course I needed to put some type of optic on there because I had the opportunity to do so. Um, I can't say enough good things about the iron sights. If you were to only use the iron sights because you are either a giga chad or you're absolutely trapped in another dimension and refuse to take the advantages that are given to you in society and in technology, either case, you're gonna be fine. This brings us to the end. This brings us to the butt. The butt on the PTR-91 is, of course, extremely iconic. You, of course, do have the collapsible, which I absolutely hate. We will not be talking about that one because I just don't like it. But this one is wonderful. There are many things that you can do to it, and many improvements have been made in butt socks um, when it comes to the G3 series, specifically from the Swedes and uh, especially from Spur. Uh, lots of different buffers have been out there. Many countries have fielded the G3 and its variants for a long time. And so understand that when it comes to the buffers that you can put in the buttstock, there are many that will help with the recoil quite a bit. So that's a quick note there. Now, also, you should understand that if yours is very old, understand that the buffer might be slowly disintegrating. Probably time to get a new one. So that brings us to the end on the PTR-91. So I guess, what are my thoughts? Um, I, of course love the HK-91, the HKG-3. The PTR-91 is really close. You have to understand that for the price of around $1,000 to $1,200, you might find one for less. It is it is really hard to pass up. So it, of course, it, it's not at the level of the HK-91, but it is still a good fieldable rifle. Now understand that when you get it, you need to make sure that you put it through its paces to make sure that you've got a good one. If not, get it in for warranty, get it repaired and just put rounds through it. You're not gonna have the same durability and legendary reliability 
that the HK G3 had, but I think you're getting pretty close for a pretty, pretty good price. So overall, I would put the PTR91 in the OK category. And beyond the OK category, it is certainly a vibe, and no matter what, with 308, you will be vibe checking people. <sighs> Get your hands on them, try it out, but the only thing that really matters when it comes to any of this is training. Get out there and get training. I would be terrified of somebody who just trained all day with this bad boy, just shooting, taking targets out at six, seven, eight hundred meters with this. Absolutely terrifying when it comes to the weapon. Now, that being said, if you don't train with it, you're absolutely going to suck with it. So get out there, get training. Tons of great places to get training from. Haley, Pat McNamara, uh, Bear Solutions, Cogworks. Get out there, train, be better than you were yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got nothing else for you. Last thing for you guys. Things are getting crazier and crazier out there. Don't lose your humanity. Be a good person. Be a good person to your community and make this place a little bit better. There are many ways to do that. I don't know what that's going to be for you, but please be that ambassador of goodness to those who are around you. Help your neighbor and let's make this world a better place. All of course, shooting and training. Because you never know. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. We're done.